all of those components are given to us through the Word of God. That we can learn from tabernacle worship, temple worship, in order to impact how we draw before the Lord for the purpose of giving Him thanks, praising Him, and exalting His name. And we're going to begin in our study this evening with chapter 30, a new chapter for us in the book of Exodus. And initially, we're going to see that there's an instrument, a vessel, that is part of the worship experience. And that vessel, that instrument, is the altar. But not the bronze altar that we spoke of earlier in our study of the book of Exodus that was in the courtyard outside that holy place and outside that other holy place, the most holy place. No, we're speaking about a different altar. And this is the incense altar. Now we know something. When we look at the book of Revelation and also in the book of Hebrews, we are given greater instructions concerning this altar for incense. And when that incense went up to the Lord, we see that that, that accompanied with that smoke, that incense offering, what accompanied it was the prayers of the people. For example, we know that Zechariah, and I'm not talking about the prophet, but the priest who was the father of John the Baptist. He went in, according to Lot, at the right time, being called by God through this Lot to offer up the incense offering. And as he did so, and the people were praying, and their prayers ascended with that smoke. We know that Zacharias, or Zachariah in Hebrew, he was given revelation about a son that was going to be born to his barren wife, Elizabeth. And we see that that son, John the Baptist, was the forerunner that prepared the way for God's redemptive work. And understand that there is a close relationship between redemption and the kingdom. It's only through a redemptive experience that you can have a kingdom hope and a kingdom experience. So notice here, in the first part of chapter 30 of Exodus, we're going to be dealing with the incense altar, but we have to be careful. Because there are those that will present and say, the book of Hebrews, it speaks in Hebrews chapter 9 and verse 4 about the incense altar. And in the book of Hebrews, it's got it in the wrong location compared to what we see here. And that simply is not exactly correct. Because we're going to see that there are two incense offerings. One is made twice a day, every day. And it's made in the holy place. That's where Zachariah, Zacharias, the father of John the Baptist was, in that holy place, not in the most holy place. But there's also, and we see this, for example, in Leviticus chapter 16, and whenever you hear that 16th chapter of Leviticus, I hope you know something. I hope you know that that entire chapter is dedicated to one day, a special day, a most special day. I'm speaking about the day called Yom HaKippurim, the day of atonement or atonements, as it literally is stated in Hebrew, and we'll see this today. So there was the incense altar that was in the holy place. But there was also incense made once a year on the Day of Atonement, and that would have been in the most holy place, the Holy of Holies. Now, when the writer of Hebrews, and there's no mistakes 
in, in the Bible. We make the mistakes, not the Holy Spirit. He inspired these authors to write down everything in the original text perfectly. No errors. And here's what we need to remember. When we look at the book of Hebrews, especially when we look at the work of Messiah, he is presented over and over as our great high priest. And the chief day for the high priests was Yom Kippur, the Day of Atonement. And therefore, in speaking about, and this was the context for Hebrews chapter 9, there's an emphasis on the incense altar that was used on the Day of Atonement, not the normal one. Now, the incense altar, in a general sense, is unique. And the reason why I say that is this. When we went through earlier on in the book of Exodus, the various vessels, instrument, the tabernacle, and what would become the temple furniture, like the altar, the table, showbread, the Aron Habrit, the Ark of the Covenant, the menorah, and such, we came in not contact with the incense altar. It's not until now. And this separation has a purpose to it. And one of the purposes is to speak about the uniqueness of it. So with that long introduction, let's begin the book of Exodus and chapter 30. Once again, Moses is receiving this, what we would call tavnit, this, this pattern that God is giving to him of what was in the heavenly area. Now Moses is called to supervise and oversee a replica in this world. And what's the purpose? Once again, worship. That we could draw near to God. And really, it's when we do what is necessary to draw near to God that God draws near to us. Chapter 30 and verse 1. And you shall make an altar for the burning of incense. And this altar is going to be made of acacia wood, make it with acacia wood, et se shiti. Now, so much of the tabernacle furniture had acacia wood as its foundation. Likewise, look at verse 2, we're going to find that it is like a square because its length is going to be one cubit, and its Width is going to be one cubic. So its length and its width is one cubic each, and then it says a square it should be. But its height is going to be two cubics, and then it says from it, there's also going to be its horns, horns of the altar. So all of this is very reminiscent of the normal altar, but there's a change. We find that this, this incense altar, is going to be covered over like the Aron Habrit, the Ark of the Covenant, and like other instruments, it is going to be covered over with pure gold. And that's going to be true for its, and it's a word, Gog. Gog is Ruth, so it's its top portion. And also, Kirotav, also its walls, its sides, all around. And its horns as well. And you shall make for it, for this incense altar, you shall make a golden crown all around it. So this is like a, a decorative aspect of it for the top portion. Verse, verse 4. And also, this altar is going to have two rings of gold you should make for it. And it is going to be from underneath the crown, like the crown molding, the decorative part of this altar. Underneath it, it's going to have these two rings 
and we know something. We know that it's underneath its crown, on the two sides, its two sides. You shall make of it on its two sides. And there shall be, and it's the word batin, houses. Now, these are places, containers. And what are they for? They're for the rings in order that, notice what it says, in order that you shall, shall place there these badim. What are badim? They are poles. We've talked about this for many other of the instruments. The Ark of the Covenant had these, these uh, uh, poles. Also, the tabernacle in the most holy place had the, the table of showbread that had these rings. So does this altar. So it has these rings that you put in the, the poles in order that you might carry it with them. Verse 5. And you shall make these, these poles, some of the Bible will say stabs, and they're different in some way. You should make them out of acacia wood, cover them with, once again, gold. Verse 6. And you shall set it, this is this altar, this incense altar, you shall set it before, and pay great attention here, set it before the parochet. What is the parochet? that veil. Now, many of you are familiar. We talked about this veil earlier in our study several weeks ago. And I also mentioned this is the same veil that we read about in Matthew chapter 27. In verse, I believe, verse 51, where it was, was torn in two from the top to the bottom. So you put it before the parochet, before this, this veil, which is and the idea here is which is against, meaning it's facing the, the Ark of the Testimony, which is before the Kaport, that is that mercy seat, which is upon the testimony. Which, and he says here, I will meet. Now, this is a word. If we look at this word, which is a verb in its noun form, it's va'ad, which is like a committee. And a committee meets for discussion. And God is saying, I will meet you there at that location. Verse 7. And you shall burn the incense upon it. Who shall do that? Aaron. So Aaron shall burn the incense upon it. The incense of samim, kitor samim. Now, this is a spice incense. In the morning, in the morning when you, and this is word, make good the, the narot. Now, this is talking about the menorah, that golden lampstand. We know that it is kindled in the evening, and in the morning, we, we reset it. That is, the priest who was called to do so by lot, he would go in and he would reset everything, put in oil, make sure the wicks are proper, everything ready to light it later on in the day at, at the evening time, immediately before the evening. So he tells Aaron here that uh, he's going to be the one that, that uh, initially kindles this incense offering of spices each morning and you do that as you clean the narrow the candles and it's wicks it's oil it's not wax candles but it's the place where the light emits from when you're cleaning that you do so having lit the incense offering so as he does that with the menorah the incense goes up which once again relates to the prayers of the saints. Verse 8. Now we're dealing with the evening time. And we read, And when Aaron lights the, the candles, and here again it's the word in modern Hebrew for candles, but once again it's the place where the oil was with the wick out of it that was kindled. So when you do it in the twilight, 
As we talked about last week, this word ben ha arbaim. This is this time shortly before dark. So you do that in the late afternoon. And when you do it in the afternoon and you light the candles once again, you have this incense offering being burned. And the next word is tamid, which means always. So this service in the morning and in the evening, when you clean and set in order the menorah, getting it ready for the evening, you kindle the, the incense offering. And likewise, in the evening, as you light the menorah, once more, you also kindle this, this incense offering, these spices. And you do it every day, twice a day, and you do it before the Lord throughout your generations. Verse 9. Now, this is a unique offering, this incense offering, and we're told, look at verse 9. And you do not offer up a burnt offering concerning it. That is, you don't offer up an offering of a strange incense. So don't offer up a strange incense, only what God commands. And now it says, and no burnt offering and no grain offering. Some will say meat offering, but it's really a grain offering. So no burnt offering, which is in the morning. No grain offering, which is in the afternoon. You don't do it with it. Nor do you do a libation, pour upon it a libation. None of these things. The incense off offering stands alone. It's separated from these other offerings which are made. Verse 10. Now it gets interesting. Because we're told something additional. And it's only really with the understanding of this passage and looking at it because of what we learn from it from the book of Leviticus chapter 16. And then what is said in Hebrews chapter 9, can we properly understand it? Look at verse 10. And Aaron will atone concerning its horns. These are the horns of this incense altar. He's going to do that, and it says here, he's going to do it achat beshana, one time a year. Now, when is he going to do that? Well, he's going to do it one time a year from the blood of the sin offering of Kippurim. Now, I would circle this. I don't know how it's translated in your Bible, but let's read verse 10 very carefully. We have the word atone, like the day of atonement. Here it's the word kiper. So, ve kiper, aharon al karnotav, achat be shana, shana. And Aaron shall atone concerning its horns, the horns of this altar, once a year. And what does he atone these horns with? From the blood of the sin offering of Kippurim. Kippurim is the biblical way to refer to the Day of Atonement. So what we know here is on the Day of Atonement, he does an extra service. Now, we can see this if you hold your place in Exodus chapter 30 and you go to Leviticus, Leviticus chapter 16. This is taught. If you look, for example, at chapter 16, verses 12 and 13, it says that Aaron, this high priest, that he shall take full of the censer. So he places on the censer a full amount of coals of fire from upon the altar which is before the Lord. Now, this is unique. This is done on Yom HaKippurim. And he makes a handful of spices, this incense spices, which are, are very thin. And he brings them from the house of the parochet. Now, this would be from the holy place, not the most holy place. But notice what he says in verse 13. He brings them 
into the most holy place and he sets this incense concerning or upon the fire which is before the Lord and it will cover the cloud of incense. It is going to cover what? ha So what we find here, and this is so significant, Aaron, he has these unique incense. He goes into, because most of his work is done in the most holy place, the Kodesh Kodeshim, the holy place. But he takes from the coals of the general altar. Now, this is where the the bull was offered up. He takes the blood from, but he also goes and takes the coals from the altar, the incense altar in the most holy place. He brings those coals. He places them upon apparently another altar, and this is what the writer of Hebrews was speaking about. And then he takes that handful of, of special incense, And it says he places it upon the fire before the Lord. That's in the most holy place. And it covers, this cloud covers the, of incense covers the kaport, that mercy seat, which is the covering of the Ark of the Covenant, the Ark of Testimony, which is in the most holy place, not the holy place, but the most holy place, the holy of holies, which is over the testimony And when he does this, he won't die. So this gives us and answers the questions, the apparently contradictive statement that some people see in Hebrews chapter 9 and verse 4. It's not. When the writer of Hebrews is speaking of this, he's speaking about it from the context of Yom Kippur. That's what he's teaching about because he's emphasizing Messiah as our high priest. So let's go back to to verse 10, back in Exodus 30. And Aaron shall atone concerning the horns, its horns, the horns of the altar, once a year from the blood of the sin offering. This is the sin offering that was altered, offered up on the normal altar in the courtyard, the bronze one on Yom Kippurim. He does this once a year to make atonement concerning himself throughout your generations. Kodesh Kodeshim, Hu Ladonai. The Holy of Holies, it is unto the Lord. So now we know that this work we're talking about is in the Holy of Holies, the most holy place, which is only entered into on the day of Yom Kippur. So now that that seemingly conflict that so many people like to to twist and try to attack the Word of God and the book of Hebrews and oftentimes the New Testament in general, we have the solution. Well, now let's move very quickly to chapter, still in chapter 30 and verse 11. We're entering into a new Torah portion, Parshat Ki Tisa. And we're just going to do verses 11 through 16. We're going to do it very quickly. And this has to do with the census. And notice what we read here. Verse 11. And the Lord spoke to Moses saying, Ki tisa et rosh b'nei Israel. For when you lift up the head of the children of Israel for their census. So notice. A census is being taken, but uniquely. It's not like the census that David did that got him in trouble. That was one of faithlessness, not based upon the instructions of God. David counted all the men of war. That's not what we're told to do here. This is a unique one. And taking the census, notice it's that phrase, ki tisa rosh, to lift up the head. Now, the context here is getting things ready for the daily worship. And worship, this expression, to lift up your head, is a statement of encouragement and a statement of, and here's the key, God acknowledging you, God acknowledging you in worship. So once again, look at verse 12. For you will lift up the head, of the children of Israel 
for their census, every man shall set a atonement, kofir, for his soul before the Lord. Now, what this is talking about is a payment. And that payment is for the daily worship service, and not just the daily worship service, but also for the day of Kippur service. The children of Israel did not offer up anything. It was the priesthood that did so. It was them through this daily or this once a year daily, once a year sacrifice that we're talking about now when the census was taken. So it says that, that this should be for the atoning of the children of Israel's soul. When they are, are registered, when they are counted, that there shall not be among them negif, that is a plague, when they are counted. Now, if you count them just regularly, it brings about a judgment. We saw that in the life of David when he counted them, not for God's purposes, but for his purpose. To know how strong he was militarily so that he could go to battle and take plunder. God didn't tell him to do that. This is not proper. And the plague came. Verse, verse 13. This one, and it means everyone should give all the ones who pass through the census. It says that they should give, each one should give, machazit hashekel. That is that half shekel, and it's the holy shekel. Now that is a weight. The weight that was prescribed, and what is that? It is 20 gera. So the, the shekel that's holy that is used for this census, it weighed 20 geras and it couldn't be, be changed. It was a unique coin for this purpose. And it says every man is called to give that as a, a half shekel offering to the Lord. Verse 14. For everyone who passes through the census and who's qualified for that, every man who is 20 years old and older. So you have to be 20 to give this, this half shekel offering which supported the work in the tabernacle and then the temple thereafter. It was given once a year for all the daily sacrifices that were made for the community not speaking about individual sacrifices and offerings, not speaking about holiday offerings, but speaking about the daily one, the morning and the afternoon. So we read here, everyone who's 20 years and older, a male, he shall give this offering to the Lord. Verse 15. Now, if you're rich, it says the rich one should not add to it. And the dal, dal is one who's in a meager financial situation. That word dal can mean almost destitute. So this one can't give less than the half of shekel. To give it as the offering unto the Lord. For what purpose? For the atoning of your souls. In order that there might be a change in one's spiritual condition. And in this case, everyone's equal. Everyone gives a symbolic testimony in support of the work, in faith of the temple service. That's what this is about. Verse 16, our last verse. And you shall take the, some Bibles will say silver, that's fine. But it's relating to money, the, the silver shekel. You shall take that silver, that Money for the atonement, and here again, haktipurim, atonements, because we're speaking about the daily one and also yom haktipurim. You take it from the children of Israel, and you set it concerning, meaning give it for the purpose of the work of the tent of the meeting, that is the tabernacle, the tent of the meeting when it stood. And it shall be for the children of Israel, this daily work that goes on first in the tabernacle, and then when the temple was established in Jerusalem, it was for a purpose. And what's that purpose? 
for a memorial before the Lord, that the Lord will remember. We would remember our need for atonement. We'll talk about that. But that God would remember his covenant purposes. We want atonement so that there's no hindrance between us and receiving God's covenantal promises. So it's a reminder before the Lord, meaning us coming before the Lord in order to make atonement concerning your souls, meaning that it has a a spiritual purpose to it. So again, we see how important, how much information is given in regard to this incense altar and why it is immediately after speaking about the incense altar, we go into the machazit ha-shekel, that half-shekel offering, because it's foundational. And it's also inclusive of the major work that was done in the tabernacle and then after in the temple, that the people could find forgiveness, that their situation could be restored back to God in order that they could worship Him and be recipients of those covenantal promises from God. Worship is so vital in changing us and positioning us where we can become the recipients of the good things of God. And as we saw, it is worship that that causes God to acknowledge us. If we're not interested in worshiping God properly, then God's not going to be interested in acknowledging us in our circumstances, when we have problems. He's not going to be actively involved in our life. All of this was for a memorial that we might remember, and by doing so, that we would position ourselves by this worship service where God would remember his covenant promises to us and that he would move to fulfill them. Over and over, we see how important worship is is. Well, I'll stop with that. Until next week, Shalom from Israel.